Good morning. I well, morning for us. Hello to everybody for your afternoon. <laughs> I'm Amanda Caseri, and I'm a white woman with curlyish blonde hair. I'm wearing a blue sweater with a red scarf. And this is Julia Ferrioli, who is a white woman with curly brown hair and is wearing a flannel shirt. Together, we co-lead the Google side of Project Ocean, where we study open source as ecosystems and complex networks, which is why we call ourselves open source scientists and archaeologists. And we're here today to talk to you about what you should consider and what you should avoid when you think about metrics for systems like open source. If you prefer, you can find our slides and speaker notes at this URL. It's uh, bitl.ly backslash foss dash backstage dash pram. And so what exactly is open source? And there is a standard definition, which we use and talk about. It's maintained by the Open Source Initiative. The definition focuses mostly on how software is hardware and distributed and licensed, uh, as well as what you can and cannot do with software and still call it open source. And we bring this up because when we talk about open source, uh, we talk about more than licensing and distribution rules. Open source has evolved to represent a framework that shapes how software is created, released, shared, distributed, as well as the communities themselves and how they form around the projects. And because we know that open source is not just technical projects, but a combination of systems of technical and social components, it's actually a socio-technical system. And so let's break down what that means a bit. When we examine a socio-technical system, we have to consider the technical components and in infrastructure, like code bases, packing, packaging indices, and metadata from the mailing lists. We have to look at the social components, which are the people, the communities, as well as the social contracts that they agree on together, and the interactions between these different systems. The socio-technical element is why measuring open source is so difficult. We have this gut instinct that open source is critical to modern business, but we don't have an agreed upon way of measuring it. It's not that people haven't tried, <laughs> um, but a major problem is around data and metrics. Nadia Egbal outlined this problem in her Roads and Bridges report. She says that usage metrics are either highly inaccurate or simply unavailable. This is not an easy problem to solve for. And the impact of digital infrastructure is still very difficult to measure. But without data about which tools are used and how much we rely upon them, it is hard to paint a clear picture of what is underfunded. She continues to postulate that with better metrics, we could describe the economic impact of digital infrastructure, identify critical projects that are lacking support, and understand dependencies between projects and people. So let's talk about how to define better, more meaningful metrics in the context of open source. Better metrics focus on useful metrics. This fairly straightforward approach can help guide you through the creation of metrics. First, you need to identify your objectives. Then we define their observable aspects, establish baselines, define the trends that we want to see, and determine our signal phenomena. Let's walk through this step by step. It's tempting to determine what you can measure first when thinking about metrics. This, that approach can lead to an abundance of data collected, but it can also lead to misleading metrics. Instead, first you need to identify your objectives. You need to understand what you want. You need to know what you care about. If you can't answer both of those, it's time to brainstorm again. And remember, these aren't set in stone. As your project and its associated community change, you can always change them or formulate new ones. Next, it's time to define aspects of each objective that can be observed. You need to understand how what you want actually works. Another way to think about an aspect is the trait. Choosing aspects of your metrics is the most important step to remember that, you should, that what you should measure is not the same as asking what you can measure. 
It allows you to reach beyond the easily obtainable data into information that truly tells the picture of your objective. Sometimes what you're interested in doesn't match up to the data that you can actually collect. In these cases, we can use proxy variables, which can circumscribe what you're actually trying to measure. Now we can establish a baseline for each aspect. You can't measure progress or regression without understanding where you are currently. If you don't know where you are now, you can make an informed estimate in a few ways. One, is to, one way is to examine other projects to see where they are as an analytical starting point, then measure for a short period of time before you reestablish your baseline. Step four is defining your desired trend. You need to know where you want to go. Do you want more of something? Okay, that's increasing. You want something to reduce? That's a decreasing trend. And uh, the often ignored steady, straight, steady state trend is when we want things to stay the same. Lastly, we have determining our signal phenomena. Signal phenomena determine when a change in a phenomenon will appear in an observation. This is so important because you need to know what changes to expect over time and when they will impact you. Does your aspect capture events before the impact shows in other metrics? That's a leading signal. Does it show it after? That's a lagging, lagging signal. This may seem pretty straightforward, these, these five steps, but that's the point. The point is to be able to move from what you should measure to talking about, are these metrics useful in evaluating our progress towards our goal? The system can fall short if it fails to consider the boundaries of the system it models. If we limit ourselves, to the project, we are ignoring the impact of and on the community. We need to reset the boundaries around our metrics to include both the projects and their communities. And so let's go back to the foundation that open source is a socio-technical system. And this means we cannot focus on assumptions and goals directly tied to the systems alone. We have to expand our abstraction level beyond what's called the algorithmic framing. And so here, when we're talking about algorithmic framing, we'll be using the definition from Selbst et al.'s 2019 paper, Fairness and Abstraction in Socio-Technical Systems. So they define algorithmic framing as choosing representations, which is data, and labeling outcomes. And in machine learning, these choices are then used to compare the outputs to the inputs. And since this is standard for most data analysis that we're looking at where evaluative methods are chosen based on some kind of inputs, and compared to some kind of previous outputs, we can apply a similar methodology to open source metrics in analysis. And the problem with this framing when examining socio-technical systems is that it creates too narrow of a view. And I quote, where the abstraction is taken as a given and is rarely, if ever, interrogated for validity, despite the fact that many of these choices are made due to accidents of opportunity and access to data, end quote. And so does this sound familiar? that we would measure and create models based on the data available to us, not necessarily based on the systems we want to be observing. I think we see that quite a bit when we talk with open source projects and people who are trying to understand what is happening in open source based on the data that they can find, not necessarily the data that tells them the full picture. And as uh, Selbst et al assert, the contrast to the al algorithmic frame is the socio-technical frame. And this explicitly recognizes that models and analyses are part of a socio-technical system and that other components of these systems also need to be modeled. And we can get there by first knowing what kinds of problems these limited abstractions create. Um, that's what this work defines as abstraction traps and how to mitigate them. And so we're gonna introduce those now and we'll walk you through those where you might see them in the process of creating metrics for open source. And so first uh, we have what's called the framing trap. And this is when we fail to model an entire system over which a social criterion, such as fairness in the case of the paper, uh, will be enforced. Second, we have what's called the portability trap. 
And this is when we fail to understand how repurposing algorithmic solutions designed for one social context may be misleading, inaccurate, or otherwise do harm when applied to a different context. Third is the formalism trap. This is the failure to account for the full meaning of social concepts, which can be procedural, contextual, and contestable, and cannot be resolved through mathematical formalisms. Next is the ripple effect trap. And that's when you fail to understand how insertion of a technology into an existing social system changes the behaviors and embedded values of a pre-existing system. And last, they present the solutionism trap. And this is when we fail to recognize that the possibility uh, that the best solution may not involve technology at all. And so to tie the concepts of creating useful metrics and abstraction tracks together, Julie and I would like to walk you through an example. So we have created a fictitious but beautifully illustrated uh, comprehensive data science library written entirely in Go um, called GoNum. We do wanna indicate this is not actually real, uh, but we'd like to talk to you if anybody's interested in creating this. Uh, and we're eager to get feedback on our brand new data science library um, and grow the user base. But because we're scientists, we like to share our work and we want other people to use things we've created. Um, before, our launch, our lab, before we launch our library, uh, we're gonna process, uh, go through a process to help us figure out where our work is, where we're not, we're moving in the right direction. And here's how we might go about it. Okay, going back to the, the process we outlined earlier, remember our first step is to identify the objectives. So we've identi identified three possible ones. The first is, is our target user adopting it? Is it easy to set up by themselves? I feel like with a lot of data science libraries, um, people kind of get stuck on the installation process. I blame Fortran, honestly. Um, and, and finally, does the library meet our target users' needs? All of these objectives are worth pursuing, but for the purpose of this example, let's focus on one. The library is easy to install. So if you're not familiar with, with Go, the setup process is actually, you know, pretty straightforward. We can go to Go's package registry. Um, from there, there's a search. We can search for data science libraries, and hopefully we'll locate our very our new package, GoNum. From there, we can read the documentation, decide if we want to actually install this library, if it's right for us. And then we run a, a command of go get GoNum, which is how we install the package. And finally, we build our first application against it um, and hopefully nothing goes wrong. And so we're gonna pause here for a moment because this is actually a place where um, even Julie and I almost fell into the formalism trap. Um, there's a great opportunity when you're defining objectives um, to do this because the formalism trap in this case would be that we could fail to account for fully, fail to fully account for the full meaning of social concepts, which cannot be resolved into mathematical formalism. Um, and in this one, we were making the assumption that we can just record the steps we take to install the library to know what to measure. Um, the where, place where Julie and I ran into this even is, uh, is her familiarity with Go is so much stronger than mine. And my familiar with data science libraries and other languages has experience in some more context uh, than she does. But as we're talking, going through the process of, well, what does installation and setup look like? Um, we both entered in at completely different places. And so even though we are both doing with the knowledge that we have to outline the process from our point of view, we even can't fully account for all the concepts that impact or aren't observed in an installation. Um, those social concepts like experience, which you can't represent or explain through mathematical formalisms. Um, in addition to that, there's another place that we identified in the make a decision step um, that's probably potentially procedural contextual um, that may prevent people from adopting a library like this. And one of those might be an open source license that's attached to this library, may not comply with the user's corporate open source policies. 
And we have no way of capturing that kind of data in this metrics pipeline to tell us whether or not our library and our adoption is successful just based on the aspects that we've identified as well as the objectives that we're naming. So maybe the the whole process of installation is a little bit too too broad. So let's narrow down on one specific aspect that we can really sink our teeth into. The actual process of pulling the library onto a user's computer and ensuring they can build against it. So what can we measure about the installation itself? Um, the two things that we thought about was the successful installation. Can you install it? Can you literally pull it onto your computer? And can you build against it? But these things can't necessarily be, be properly captured. So the, the question is for a successful installation, can we figure out some proxies to use, such as issues filed, questions, um, et cetera? Because privacy dictates that we can't actively measure successful installations. We don't want the library to call home, right? That's not, not cool. Um, so what are some assumptions that we have around actual installation? Well, if we untease it, it's actually quite complex. There are some things that we don't often think about. Does the person have access to source control? That's a, that's a good question. Does the user have Go installed or is that actually an extra step that they'll need to complete before they can use our library? Do they have a compatible system? Especially with data science, like you're going to need some, you're going to need some memory, right? <laughs> so um, there's the open question of whether they've they've got the technical requirements to actually run the library. And finally, um, data science libraries tend to have quite a few dependencies. So the final question that, or the final assumption that we have is, does the person have sufficient bandwidth to actually install the library plus its dependencies? These are all potential proxies um, around the, or apologies, <laughs> I got mixed up. Um, so these are all assumptions that we have to take into account when thinking about successful installations. Yeah, and this is another place that we wanna start examining where it's potentially possible to fall into one of these abstraction traps. And so um, here, if we're um, looking at download data or trying to understand what download data tells us about our user base, um, you can very easily fall into the framing trap by, fr by failing to fully account for all the users who could be working with our technical system. As Julia pointed out, there's a lot of assumptions that we just made or that we would be making about somebody who is able to have access to these kinds of libraries, to these kinds of um, pipelines, to the source control, um, as to their connectivity issues. Um, and all of those things, because we care about making our work as universal as possible, then those are things that we can think about, um, look at the assumptions for and mitigate. And we can do this by adopting what's called a heterogeneous engineering approach. And that simultaneously considers the technical components as well as the humans who work and live alongside them. And so for here, um, for example, when we are looking at like metadata from successful downloads for something such as geographic region, we have to still recognize as a part of our analysis on our metrics that this only shows part of the picture. So we can't say from this kind of data, well, we're really doing well in this country from that metric. Um, but it does allow you to ask better questions like, what drove downloads in this area? Why were these users able to successfully download here? And something like, what are other blockers to a successful download that might exist for other users in this area? 
And so by moving from this algorithmic frame to the data frame that you're looking at outputs and inputs to the humans that move alongside of it in the socio-technical frame, you can ask better and different questions. And we really want to emphasize this point, especially as you're looking at metrics, that these are always a starting off point for you to ask more and better questions like this, especially about the people you care about, which is not only who is using your information or who is using your project, but who could be using your project. Okay. Um, now that we uh, we've identified our um, our potential metrics, we can move ahead with establishing baselines. Again, you need to know where you are now. But this is a new library, so we really aren't anywhere currently. Remember that we can make an informed estimate to try and back into a baseline. We could take an inventory of other libraries and look at their metrics and start measuring our library's performance with respect to them. And so here's where it's very easy to fall into the portability trap uh, when you're trying to estimate where you are and where you want to be, um, especially because you're looking for other uh, analogs or other comparisons that you could make against the thing that you're working on. Programming and computer science in general hoards portability to be a highly valuable trait. And the problem with this can be when you're not able to accurately assess um, when solutions that to, to questions from one context would lead you in the wrong direction. Um, so in this case, uh, if we are comparing our library to other types of Go libraries, we could get misleading or inaccurate um, inaccurate baselines or estimates uh, for a data science specific Go library. Uh, data science, like Julia said, has dependencies, many dependencies in a project, um, such as access to other data um, and scientific computing libraries, as well as access to data to begin with, which is not necessarily a prerequisite for other Go libraries as people are looking to figure out what to do with computing with Go. Um, Go is also not currently currently high on the list of preferred languages for data scientists or data analysts. So people who might want to be using this kind of package may not be present in the ecosystem you're looking with. And um, so here you would want to focus on assumptions for your specific application. You want to look at your domain. You want to look at the programming language. You want to look at who is present to your community as well as their community needs where you might be meeting a gap that didn't exist before. Um, and so if you can't find a good analog with where you are, you can start at the very beginning, which is a very good place to start at zero. Okay, we've, uh, we've avoided the portability trap and established our baselines. Next step is how we want to see our measurements progress, how they trend. Again, we can't measure the successful installations directly, but some things we can measure are number of downloads maybe increasing, with the number of issues decreasing. If we can see the number of installation issues decreasing, we can safely interpret, or can we safely interpret that to mean that the number of users who experience difficulties have gone down? And coupling that with the increased numbers of people downloading the library, that seems to be a clear indication of an easy installation process, right, Amanda? Well, this is also where you want to make sure that you're taking caution. Um, and so you have the um, opportunity here um, to fall into the solutionism trap. Uh, we've done a good job so far of reminding ourselves of the human component and the social context surrounding our new data science library. By analyzing our trend data, it's really easy to fall into this kind of trap um, if we assume that our metrics process and the approximations that we are making are telling us the story we need to hear and the full picture of what's happening. Um, but dashboards and metrics are only indicators of project health, and they may not contain all of the nuance and the unmeasurable attributes you need to understand to make full project decisions. Uh, human preferences are not rational, and human psychology is not conclusively measurable. Um, so you cannot fully quantify your community or your users through these automated pipelines. Uh, so you have to focus really here and understand that, remember that when you're looking at your project health, when you're looking at your community health, because that's part of your project and what you're working on, that you have to continue to build communities and not audiences. And the difference here really is that connection piece. So who gets to have voice, who gets to have attention and who gets to make decisions 
and how those are listened to. So turning those unidirectional arrows into bidirectional arrows. And so ask people open-ended questions that don't fit cleanly in a one to five scale on a user survey um, and learn from their experiences and what shapes them to help really understand how you are doing, how your project's doing and where you want the direction of things to go. The final step in our metrics journey is to determine our signal phenomena for installing the library. An increase in platform support requests could indicate an increase in the number of types of users. That would be a good example of a leading signal or a leading indicator. An increase in submitted patches to the installation documentation could indicate that users are already frustrated and need instructions that are more clear. That would be a lagging signal. So, with all these uh, steps and traps to avoid, remember that the metrics you choose are a reflection of what matters to you, your project, and your community. Take the time to be thoughtful, to dive deeper into what matters to be measured, and to avoid the abstraction traps. If your goal is not to just release work, but to foster and nurture the ecosystem that we all rely upon, I think we can agree that the extra work is necessary for the common good. We're in this raft together. So here are some uh, resources and references that, that we mentioned in, in the talk today. Uh, the first two are the uh, roads and bridges and the, the paper with the abstraction traps. Um, and finally, we have some uh, a couple of links to the Ocean Project Open Source Complex Ecosystems and Networks uh, with both our GitHub repository as well as uh, opportunities for research awards. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, great. Thank you, um, Amanda and Julia, so much for, for that talk. It was um, really good. Um, so I want to say to the audience, um, if you have any questions, um, drop them in the chat or the questions bar. We have um, a couple of minutes um, for questions, so don't be shy. Um, put those in. I wanted to, while we wait for anyone's questions, I, I wanted to ask something. Um, the, there's a quote in there, build communities, not audiences, um, which I think is uh, really stood out to me. Do you have any examples um, that have impressed you where that has taken place so that we can get an idea of, of what that looks like? I mean, I think there are, there are so many different examples um, in, I, I feel like, you know, some of the the more popular examples are uh, like Kubernetes, which I feel like has done a very good job at bringing the community along with them. Um, and they've been very intentional about that. Um, Amanda, do you have a, a shining example in mind? Um, I actually think some of the, like the, looking at the history of how um, core maintainers have changed in Python over time, I think is an excellent example of this. So the way that the language community has changed from um, invitation only um, style um, core maintainers groups into mentorship and to bringing people with them and to seeking and looking for new maintainers through a growth network, um, that to me speaks more to looking looking for feedback onto how a group is moving and, and moving a project from um, a central um, individual person and figurehead into more of a com like a committee style um, project for something that is so large. Both of those I think are kind of good signals that people are looking to really create feedback loops as opposed mm -hmm. to being one direction with projects. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, the first one is, um, <clears throat> Uh, what component to start with when developing community health metrics for long-term assessments? So how often should they be revised? So I would encourage for um, any kind of frequency question around metrics really needs to take into consider in consideration how often things are changing. So if things are changing very quickly in your community or if there is some kind of global crisis happening, 
that is impacting uh, many different groups of people at the same time, or even local crisis that's happening in a group of your core users, you should definitely increase frequency in terms of making sure that you are monitoring and understanding what is happening with a group of people, because things are changing more rapidly to impact them. Um, and so you wanna keep an eye on that. Um, the other thing I would say would be is if you see any um, any um, increases in any of your signals. So Julia laid out well, when you're looking for increasing, decreasing, steady state, lagging and leading. If you see any of those also changing very quickly or um, then I would say really decrease your sampling window. So that way you understand better when things are changing that you need to meet, those needs that you need to meet. Julia, would you add something? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I would just add, you know, I, I, I know the the temptation to try to get like a one de facto answer, um, but the the unfortunate reality is that there is no uh, one one answer to to that question. It really depends on um, on the contexts involved. So, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, um, okay. So I have another question. Um, in your experience, what is the maintainer reaction when you propose gathering or drawing on um, qualitative data? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, qualitative data has to be handled very carefully. Quantitative data does as well, but qualitative needs even more care in terms of privacy and sometimes anonymity. Um, our suggestions, by the way, are for um, any open source project who has a desire to move in this direction. There's no obligation, right? So if your project is your, if your full desire as a creator is to make something, put it into the world and anybody who wants to or can use it can pick it up, but, uh, but that's it. Like that's the extent of your creation. That's absolutely fine. Right, so um, there's no obligation for um, for maintainers or creators uh, necessarily to follow up with pieces of their work. It's just a matter of whether or not you want that to be part of the component of what you're working with. Um, and so I think about it in terms of different, there are definitely different kinds of projects. Yeah, and I, unfortunately it seems as though the, the ability um, in terms of time, money, et cetera, uh, expertise to really gather qualitative data is, is sort of limited to the larger pro projects. Um, so a number of them run surveys, uh, yearly surveys, twice a year surveys, et cetera, uh, to really gather some of that, that information. But it's, it's, um, it's not a capability that's available to to every project, and we we definitely recognize that. I, I'll add in there that I also think that is an excellent opportunity to include more people in open source projects. So there are amazing designers and researchers and program managers and community managers who would like to be part of more pieces of open source, but may not necessarily want to be working on code bases or triaging or issue tracking. And so if this is a role or an area that you're interested in for your project, there are people who want to be doing that with you and contributing as in that way. And so if you are interested in doing this, but you don't want to do it yourself, you can find partners and friends and teammates to do this mm -hmm. with you. Okay, great. Um, we've gone a bit over, but we have two more questions. So we'll try and squeeze those in. Um, the first one is um, about um, referencing an earlier talk. It says, um, Nadi revealed the problem of underfunded maintainers. Have you done any, any research on sustain sustainability and well-being of FOSS authors? That's a great question. Um, I we uh, actually had a bit of a book club reading her her uh, working in public book uh, recently. Um, so in terms of underfunded maintainers, I feel as though we we've done a, a bit of research, um, but nothing super definitive. Um, I feel like Amanda, you might have done a bit more work in that in that area. Yeah, I'll say that um, we do have some open research questions that we're investigating around uh, economies in open mm -hmm. source. Yeah, so if you're interested in that, 
should uh, apply for one of those research awards. Yeah, if you have, and, and we'll say to the, the research awards, which we'll bring back up because I, this is really important. Um, those research awards are not limited to academic research. Yeah. So they are open for communities. They're open for independent researchers. Um, we'd like to really encourage um, global research reach um, around uh, researchers from all over the world, as well as the communities that you're interested in taking a look at. So please um, consider applying. Okay, great. Um, would you be able to, um... I don't know, maybe drop those links in the chat afterwards so people can click on them or sure. that would be okay. Yeah. And um, we have one last question. Um, so do you have any thoughts or comments about the work being done under the um, chaos community? So the community health analytics um, community and the tools that are available there? Yeah, one of our colleagues uh, is actually one of the contributors in chaos as well. And I think I've dropped a comment or two um, when I've been able to going into the repo. I think that's a great group of people who are working on some really interesting projects. Um, I, I like their approach. I like their community collaborative approach. Um, excited to work on more and help give feedback as well as any time as well. Uh, it's a complex area, so there's uh, there's plenty of room. <laughs> yes. <laughs>